So in the spirit of reconciliation, the Australian Dental Council acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community, and we pay our respect to elders past and present. So each year we usually have our annual member forum where we welcome all of our members to the ADC and uh, talk about themes in dental education, assessments and examinations and uh, discuss some of the major milestones and achievements of the ADC in the past year. Unfortunately, COVID has impacted us again. So um, myself, Narelle Mills, the CEO of the Australian Dental Council and the S senior leadership team, we're going to provide you with a bit of an update on some of the achievements uh, that we have um, had over the, the last 12 months. But first, let me introduce you to the senior leadership team. My name is Mark Ford. I'm the Director for Accreditation and Quality Assurance. I'm Diane Moore. I'm the Director of Corporate Services. I'm Veronica Vella, the Director for Assessments and Examinations. And I'm Tara Waller, Director of People and Culture. So Mark, in your role, you've um, seen the impact of COVID-19 on dental education. How do, how do we know that what we do ensures that students are safe to practice by the point of graduation? And do you think COVID-19 has changed that? I think COVID-19 has had a really interesting impact on dental education, and it really does depend on where you're located and what you're teaching and doing. Um, there's not a, a straightforward, it's impacted everybody in the same way because COVID hasn't impacted everybody in the same way. But having said that, our policies and our processes and the way we go about undertaking accreditation have really shown that they are strong processes and they hold up under scrutiny and under changing and, and difficult times. So the ADC had implemented its COVID monitoring protocol at the start of the pandemic. That still held true in terms of us understanding what's changing at providers, how they're facing the challenges and dealing with the challenges that their students are, are, are facing and actually still giving students some great experience. And there's some areas where students actually will be better prepared than has occurred previously. And the ADC has been on the pulse of that all the way through the pandemic and regularly fighting that, regularly sending that information out to our stakeholders. Yeah, great. Thanks, Mark. And, and what do you think the future challenges or the biggest challenges that dental education and accreditation will face now? Look, I think there's a lot we've learnt through the pandemic that I actually think will stay with us in terms of what we do and how we do it. Um, but having said that, I think dental education faces quite a few challenges. We know education providers, universities have been really heavily impacted financially, and that's got to have a flow on effect in terms of staffing profiles in those areas. Those are things that we're going to be looking out for in the next few years because there will be a trickle down effect. But also there's I guess some other challenges coming at accreditation in terms of how we demonstrate that what we do really makes a difference. So we're taking steps to address that over the next couple of years and making sure that we're ahead of the game. So Veronica, the last 12 months were in some ways more challenging than last year for the ADC and the assessments and examinations functions. How do you think the ADC has responded to these challenges? I think there is no doubt that we have had challenges like the whole world has had challenges in the when it comes to the ability to deliver assessments and examinations um, to candidates. But the ABC, I believe, has responded really well to the constant changes um, that have affected our candidates. We've implemented a number of things to try and assist our candidates get through the ABC process as quickly as possible. And one of the first things we did um, was to come to release the COVID-19 policy to assist our candidates. What that did uh, provided, it provided flexibility to our candidates who weren't impacted by border restrictions and the ability to travel to Melbourne to sit an exam for their practical, but also to candidates who were in the process of um, doing their written examination and then wanted to progress uh, to the practical. What we did for those candidates was we extended their eligibility period by one year and that gave them some confidence and comfort that while borders were closed and they weren't able to come to Melbourne, we will still give them the opportunity to go through the process as soon as possible. We handled quite a big number of postponements uh, and we realised that um, you know, we, we needed to support them. So we did that by contacting all of them and making sure that they were okay and that we had them front of mind always and that we were going to facilitate a sitting for them as soon as possible, which we have been able to achieve. 
those who then weren't able to, to come for a number of reasons and who have been outside Australia, obviously we have dealt with um, these particular circumstances differently and where needed provided additional support to them. So I think, you know, as, as an organisation, our business has continued. We have delivered as many exams as we could when we were allowed to, and we were also able to get an exemption from the, from the Victoria Government to continue our, um, our work. And that has helped incredibly, not just the ABC, but also all of our candidates. And they are the people that we're here to assist to get them across the process. Yes, and I think we've um, you know, seen the benefits of having our own managed exam centre, being able to scale up our exams and to, you know, to have control over that. And we're really thankful to the Victorian-based um, dental community for their contribution to the exam because we couldn't run that without um, the Melbourne-based examiners. I think that's been you know, really well supported from the, the dental community. Absolutely. We have been very fortunate to have our facilities here. We've been able to increase the number of um, sessions to make sure that we could get all of the candidates through the door who were able to come and sit the exam. Um, so it is a sort of luxury that we wouldn't have had if we didn't have our own examination centre and it's been really, really helpful. And as you said, we are incredibly thankful to our examiners. We have relied upon our Victoria examiners very heavily in the last year because we're, they were the ones who were here and they were able to assist us deliver the examinations um, and it's, the support we've received from them has been incredible so we are very grateful for all the work that you know they have done in assisting us with the delivery of the examination and we are looking forward to welcoming back into state examiners as things start to open up. So Tara in 2021, we established a new directorate of which you're the director for, the People and Culture area. And how do you see that uh, People and Culture director supporting the future directions of the ADC? It's been a really interesting time to start up a People and Culture directorate. Um, and, and we've heard from Veronica and Mark about some of the challenges we face from a business. But from a People and Culture perspective, what that's meant to date is We've needed to make sure that our people have the capability, um, have the confidence to adjust to different processes, to be working in a way that's really different to what we've worked um, as in the past at the ADC, um, including, you know, most of our team working remotely. So the People and Culture Director has been really focused and will continue to be really focused on setting up the culture uh, and making the culture something that's more than an office building because that's been how we've identified ourselves a lot up until now. But we know that our, our new world of work is going to be people working in hybrid ways, working in different locations. So being able to create a sense of community and connection and um, an identity with the ADC is a really important part of what the People and Culture Directorate is, is going to be doing over the next couple of years. Um, I think that as well as doing that, we need to recognise that we're a growing organisation and we're diversifying what we do in a lot of ways, which means we need a stronger foundations. So we have some really strong foundations in policies for the organisation that we are, but in terms of the organisation that we're moving to and having a leadership cohort and capabilities and procedures in place that are going to set us up to be successful as we move into new uh, business ventures as we diversify what we're doing. Um, people and culture have a really strong role in setting up what that needs to look like and making sure that we have the right people in place to do it. So I think the next the next two years of the People and Culture Directorate is going to be really exciting in enabling the work we do uh, and in making sure that our people are able to to be the best they can in achieving that. Yeah, it is. It's quite an exciting area, and um, I'm, you know, really pleased to to have you and that function in the organisation. Another important part of your role, though, is uh, having courage of our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander strategy. What do you see the ADC's vision for reconciliation being? So it's it's really interesting because if I talk about it from a high level vision perspective, um, it's really easy for us to say our vision is culturally safe healthcare. You know, it's it's healthcare that's free of bias, where Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and cultures can be respected and and their voices can be heard and amplified. But what does that actually mean for us at the ADC as opposed to any other organisation? Um, there's a couple of different things that that means for us. So firstly, we can look at it as an organisation and that's where 
the PNC directorate uh, is is kind of the expert and, and is moving towards, and that's how do we make sure that everyone in our workforce is culturally competent? How do we make sure that every interaction and every piece of work that we do is actually considering what it means to have Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voices heard and to be amplifying the leadership of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people? So that includes a, a capable workforce, but it also includes our business processes. How are we um, doing work like the work Mark's been doing on standards and competencies and building cultural safety and cultural competence into that business delivery? How are we making sure that overseas qualified practitioners have the cultural competence and can operate in a culturally safe way so that we're not only influencing reconciliation from an organisational internal perspective, we're actually influencing the system and influencing the nation towards being a more inclusive and culturally competent and culturally safe nation through our role in accreditation and assessment. So, Diane, over the last 12 months, we've been undertaking a pretty significant digital uplift project and we'll soon launch ADC Connect. How do you expect that that will change the way we work with stakeholders? So, ADC Connect will provide stakeholders with a self-service portal that will enable them to update their personal information when it's convenient for them. Board, committee members, examiners, assessors and item writers will be able to lodge claims for payments for work performed for ADC update their bank account and tax details and keep a record of their payments. Candidates will be able to submit applications and make payments online. They will be able to upload their personal information and log in to view their progress through the examination process from anywhere and at any time that suits them. Education providers will be able to upload and update information in one place, making it easier for them to report to the ADC. The ADC's investment in IT infrastructure will provide more flexibility and efficiency for ADC stakeholders, ensuring that the ADC is providing a contemporary service that customers expect. 